So this is our last lesson on step three on the critical appraisal of the relevant research. After um, identifying our clinically relevant question, uh, making it searchable and answerable, we did our search and found the relevant literature. And so we've been discussing um, over the last few lessons how we can appraise that literature to make sure that we uh, have confidence in its uh, ability to be used to help answer that question. So we're going to chat a little bit now on how we can go about doing that very practically. So as far as our key points and objectives, um, the first two there are very uh, summative in nature. Remember that this critical appraisal is about determining whether we can use the research we've found during our clinical decision-making process. And then we'll talk about how we can go about doing that and what that means. And then lastly, we'll talk about a uh, few ways we can actually uh, disseminate our process to others if that is something we choose to do. So <clears throat> it's easy to say that this critical appraisal process is the most overwhelming, but also most important part. Um, Due to the fact that search engines have made finding the research a lot easier, it's now almost too easy to find information. And so it's more important to be able to interpret the information um, and its applicability to answering our clinical question than it is finding it. So when we talk about all of this application of the critical appraisal process, that is the purpose so that we can take the evidence that we have found and then move from that to applying it. And so that is the uh, appraisal process in a nutshell. And so we've talked about the fundamentals of that and then we talked about some scales in particular that can help with that. But now we need to get down to the actual components associated with um, the appraisal and moving into what we would consider step four in the application. So when we go about um, doing this critical appraisal, it really comes down to three questions, and I would add a fourth one in there myself. But the three questions are, are the results valid? Are they reliable? And are they relevant or applicable? And then the um, fourth one that I add in there is basically, are the, are the conclusions of the article appropriate? Um, based on the fact that most of the time um, you don't need to read all of the conclusions from the article because you can make your own conclusions by reading their methods and results. Um, but oftentimes, uh, those discussion sections have a lot of that ability for application already built in there. But in order to assess the discussion section, we have to first and foremost make sure that the conclusions are appropriate based on the results of the study. And so that's the fourth question that uh, goes in there. And we'll talk about these individually here in a sec. So the first one, are the results of the study valid? And so when we get into understanding the validity of the study, it first and foremost needs to start with assessing whether or not the research design was appropriate for their clinical question. So you have to find and figure out what the author's clinical question was and then figure out the design of the study and to make sure that that was an appropriate research design. And we talked about designs previously on what makes those appropriate, so I won't go into that uh, as much now. But in order for the results to be um, applicable at all, they've got to come from a research study that was appropriately designed for the clinical question that the researchers were asking. This with validity is going to be about um, the researchers' clinical question, not so much our own. We'll talk about that uh, later. But once we've determined the applicability and then the research design, with each research design, 
there are specific areas that we need to assess, hence the uh, different questions under each component. So for the case control research design, remember these. this is a design where the subjects already have the condition of interest, and then we are following up um, over time based on this treatment, and it may or may not have a control group. Oftentimes it does not. So the most important part of a case control design is going to be the inclusion and exclusion criteria because these are the people that we're following. And so we need to understand and make sure that whatever the population is that is receiving the intervention actually has the condition um, that is of interest and so we have to make sure that that inclusion and exclusion criteria gives us enough confidence of the population as far as what the population is and then what the population is not. And then from there, depending on whether or not there are um, match controls or not, or what the design is, you have to look at that design in particular and to make sure that it was consistently applied throughout the process. Um, with these case control uh, research designs, it's um, much more of a natural process, and so you might see data being collected in more than one way. That's fine if we're just looking at a uh, treatment effect over time and we're assessing these different effects in, or this effect in different ways, but if we start trying to make comparisons between say match controls that had data collected one way and the uh, intervention group that had data collected a separate way, that would make the results not valid. For the cohort design, now as we go through and look at this, with cohorts, because they are these natural uh, groups, we first and foremost have to make sure that the groups are actually um, representative of the population uh, that the researchers are trying to assess. And so looking at those inclusion exclusion criteria um, to make sure that those are appropriate for um, assessing and making sure that that cohort actually is representative of the overall um, population that we're applying uh, this research to. Then you have to ass assess the outcome measures. Um, how were they selected? How were they um, assessed? All of that kind of reliability and validity of the methods or of the um, measures themselves uh, comes into play here. Um, and then finally, in cohort studies, where we don't have randomization to help control for confounding variables. We need to make sure that confounding variables were accounted for uh, in some way, especially with some of these prospective cohort studies. They're trying to predict the possibility of uh, sustaining an injury over a substantial amount of time. What was done in order to make sure that those confounding variables were accounted for or at least minimized in some way? And um, how might those confounding variables, if they were not accounted for or minimized, actually affect the overall uh, interpretation of the results? And then lastly is the randomized control trial. And we spent most of the time talking about this, um, so don't need to go into too much detail, right? Pedro score can help you out with these sorts of things, but you're really looking at the randomization and allocation with that. Checking to make sure the uh, groups were uh, homogeneous prior to their intervention as far as both um, with their dropouts and any changes there and also to make sure that the randomization did in fact work and uh, eliminate some of those confounding variables. Um, if uh, the groups were different at baseline on some uh, important measure then it might um, influence the results later on. And then lastly, with all randomized control trials, 
or really with any sort of research as well, were the um, outcomes collected for an appropriate period of time? Um, when were these uh, collected? Um, and how does that affect uh, the research question that they were in fact asking? The next part is the reliability of the study. And the first part of the reliability of the study as far as assessment is going to be whether or not that study is reproducible. And this reproducibility is twofold. One, is there adequate information given that would allow for you to follow the steps uh, that were done in the research in your own clinical practice? And then secondly, is the research um, uh, reproducible in the way that is this something that can actually be done outside of the situation that the research was conducted in. If there is some sort of very unique or highly technical or um, crazy apparatus designed for um, the study to do the intervention um, and you don't have access to that, um, the reliability of the study, can, and when we talk about reliability, we're in that, this case, we're talking about reliability from them to you is going to be rather low because you're not going to be able to do the same thing uh, that they did. You also then have to establish the reliability of the procedure as well as the instruments. And we talked about that previously as far as assessing the inter and intra rate of reliability and then the uh, reliability of the instruments themselves. The next question is kind of this conclusion uh, question that I talked about before as far as uh, assessing and appraising the results of the study. Um, and this then leads to assessing the conclusions. And so this is um, more difficult without the advanced understanding of statistics. And so that's why we went through some of the statistics uh, beforehand. But when it comes down to appraising the results of the study, um, the first thing is going to be to look at the raw data as much as possible and get an understanding of what the groups truly look like. Um, both at baseline as well as after uh, intervention. And so you can get this through looking at the descriptive statistics as well as those confidence intervals. And remember that those confidence intervals often uh, portrayed as 95% confidence intervals are the percentage of which the confidence that the researchers are that the overall population falls within that range. And so based on looking at these descriptive statistics, you'll be able to see whether or not these groups were the same or different um, at baseline as well as after intervention, as well as how consistent those results were with higher standard deviations and confidence intervals um, or wider ranging, I should say, the less consistent that result is and the more variability to be a variability might be within uh, those results and thereby decreasing the um, power of the conclusions. You also then need to uh, measure or assess whether the measures of effect were reported for the intervention. And we looked at this, right, with effect size. And that kind of goes right into uh, step three as well with this idea of uh, determining the p-value and whether or not the p-value was um, accurately um, determined and then whether or not that value was actually met. We talked previously in the statistics talks about this idea of um, statistical significance versus clinical significance, as well as the idea that oftentimes um, researchers will talk about approaching significance to account for low power studies. But all of these need to come into play in your understanding and your appraisal of the research in order to understand whether or not these conclusions that were made were valid. If there is a statistical significance or not simply means whether or not the a priori alpha uh, p level was reached regarding the um, confidence in not committing a type 1 uh, error. And so first and foremost, if the p-value does not reach their a priori um, 
calculations. Any conclusions that state anything about any potential differences should not be um, included in your analysis because those are inappropriate because they didn't reach the uh, researcher's predetermined um, significance level. From there, we also then need to understand this idea of effect size and whether or not um, even a statistically significant difference might not have a large effect or might not be clinically significant. And so oftentimes in the conclusions or in the discussions, you'll have discussions about um, the fact that this intervention improved um, treatment or improved uh, the condition, but at the same point in time, it's not a clinically significant improvement, thereby uh, decreasing our ability to apply those results, which then is the last question. And so when we get into this last question, as far as determining the clinical applicability of the study, this now is the transition from step three into step four, where a step four now is applying the research. And so we need to understand now as our last bit of clinical appraisal whether or not this can be applied to our situation. And so this is where we move from looking at the research um, from this point of view of the authors of the research and their clinical question and move to appraising the research for our clinical question, what we're trying to do. Understand that those may not always be exactly the same. So the first portion is going to be about whether or not the sample from the sample from their study and their subjects is similar enough to your own in order to allow for you to apply that situation um, in this new group. If there's a big difference uh, between their population and your population, uh, it may not be possible for you to uh, transfer their results to your new situation. Next is going to be determine if the findings can from the study can directly influence your clinical decision making. And this has to do with the general applicability of their research, whether or not this is something that you will be able to perform, something you will be able to do, or as well as whether or not this will be um, worth it regarding costs association, associated with the actual intervention. And so coming up with the conclusion of, okay, this is good research, but can I use it here in my situation? All right, if the intervention is some elaborate intervention and you don't will not have the resources available to do that, then um, even though it may be highly reproducible, um, in other situations, it's not in yours, and therefore it's not going to be able to be used. And then lastly is the idea of you have to assess this for any potential risks um, or benefits. And this really comes down to this idea of numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm. And so it's oftentimes this um, is reported specifically, but if not, you can calculate it uh, rather easily, but it's more important to do the concept than it is to uh, actually have the numbers. And this is in the idea of if we're trying to prevent a condition or um, how many times will we need to do the intervention in order to prevent a condition is the numbers needed to treat. The numbers needed to harm is how many times do I need to do the intervention before I have a negative reaction. The idea here is that no matter how great a intervention is, unless it is absolutely perfect where every time you do it you prevent an injury, you're going to have a certain failure rate with this where you need to do it but the result wouldn't have occurred anyway. And so it's this idea that you need to know how many times I'm going to need to do something in order to prevent the injury. And the idea, uh, the best example that often comes up is like taping an ankle to prevent um, to prevent an ankle sprain. How many ankles do you need to tape to actually prevent an ankle sprain? And so that's 
um, when you get into the prevention research, uh, the clinical applicability portion. The numbers needed to harm then is there's always risk factors associated with doing these activities. And uh, although not as often reported, the numbers needed to harm and the risks need to be considered um, in general, at least, to how risky is this intervention that we're doing and uh, how that might play within your clinical decision making, where is if it has a relatively low um, clinical utility as far as effect sizes and for your applicability, if it's relatively risky or has some risks, associated with that, that might decrease your likelihood to do it. Whereas if it's you know relatively clinically usable, outside of that, the effects might just be a little bit uh, small, but the risks are relatively low or none, you might consider implementing it uh, anyway because it's relatively easy to do um, and can only help it when it's hurt. Lastly, talk about um, some of the resources in doing this. We talked about the scales and checklists previously, but there are these two other components that I want to talk about. The first is a critically appraised paper, and you can see the different um, categories uh, listed there, but a critically appraised paper is basically this process that we just went through as far as critically appraising a single research article, but then writing it out for others to read. And so it's basically a standardized review of the article. It's single article in nature, but it describes all of the things that we've been looking at for the critical appraisal, but it's just written out for you uh, as far as a single review. You don't see that nearly as often um, because it just um, ends up diluting the overall research because you have one review article on a single original article. And so it really doesn't add as much. But these critically appraised topics now are a little bit uh, more common. Basically, this falls into uh, something in between a single research article and a systematic review, often done for, artic or for topics that have lower um, numbers of articles published before a full systematic review can be done or that have a more specific focus to do. And so a critically appraised topic goes through the same sort of things that we've been doing, um, but instead of reviewing and appraising a single research article, it ends up appraising multiple research articles. And so considering the fact that when we're doing this appraisal, we're often going to appraise each individual research article, but when we get down to that final component of the clinical applicability, we're going to be looking at multiple research articles, hopefully at least multiple research articles, that help address this question. And if they're all going in a same direction, then it increases our um, confidence in those results. And so this critically appraised topic is simply a uh, way of writing up this entire evidence-based process findings uh, through step three so that others can read your work and benefit from it as well. So this critical appraisal component really does formulate the uh, most important component in um, the evidence-based process uh, process, I guess, just process, um, because you need to move from the research in order to go to your applicability. And because um, not all research is created equal and different components, and you have to analyze the level of evidence specifically for your research question, uh, whether or not the evidence that you're reading is appropriate for your research question as well, um, you need to interpret all of that in order to be confident for your own findings. And so that's going to be the end of the critical assessment component, and we'll start moving into some specific topics with the application and outcomes assessments uh, next time.